Hello, everyone. Welcome back to my channel. Um, I am Jalen, and I'm joined by CJ for my new monthly book club as part of the Reading the Room discussion series. Today, we are discussing Acts of Service by Lillian Fishman, a book in which I have been talking about nonstop on my channel. Uh, CJ actually read it before me. You read a net galley of this like months ago, right? For the first time? Yeah. Yeah, late last year. Okay. Yeah, and so I just recently read it. I interviewed the author. I am very ready to talk about this. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining me, CJ. You are so welcome, Jalen. <laughs> the bestie in in the book club. Um, also, yes. quick plug before we get into it. Lip -lip -lip. Back in stock at Sunny's. Back in um, stock. <laughs> yeah, please we, plug Sunny's real quick. We better see the orders roll in live as <laughs> as the pot is going. Um, Sunny's is my mobile bookstore that I started in the pandemic, and we have merch, we do pop-up events, it's cute, we love used books, you know, you know the vibes, sunnysbooktruck.com. I'm so obsessed with all of that, and I keep wearing this hat, like, very frequently, I'm obsessed with it. Um, anyway, so, let's get into the book. So, first, I'm just going to start by opening up to anyone that's watching this, um, Please put in the comments what you thought of the book. Did you like it? Did you not? Questions, comments, concerns, and I will add them as we chat about this. But so to start, CJ, what did you make of it the first time you read it? And then what do you think about it now that you've reread it? Yes, I recently reread this book in anticipation for this podcast. I finished it two days ago. So I'm fresh and I'm usually not a big rereader too, which I think is something I want to talk about more and was an interesting addition to my experience overall of this book. It's just like the repetition of it all. Um, when I first read this book, I said something like quippy on my Goodreads review and was like, oh shit, this is like 50 shades of gray for queer people. Get ready. Um, I think... I immediately sensed the virality of it and could feel it having a place in like the trend forecast of like hot, sad girl lit, which is kind of funny um, to be at this point in my reading journey where you can like anticipate trends for books. You know what I mean? So that's a side note of just uh, being able to place it in the the landscape of this kind of fiction and I think is also a knock to it too. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. it, it has a category that it's speaking in. Uh, my first impressions of this book was that it was salacious and fun to read and messy and sexy at times and um, had its hand in a lot of philosophical questions about what it means to be queer, which I really liked reading about. Uh, I don't think the writing was particularly strong to me or it was saying anything completely new or groundbreaking to me and upon my second read uh that only kind of intensified I think a lot of the writing in here is bad upon my second read and I think that is what I mean when I tied into like what it means to reread and rereading books that like what what is the the qualifier for a book that demands to be reread and i think for me it is language not just themes you know what i mean so i was like mm, okay and then on second read too i still was left in that gray area of the kind of system she was questioning which i appreciated um cuz she wasn't trying to tidy anything up in uh give clear answers for her readers on what any of these identity politics mean to her and what the characters are exploring themselves that's so interesting yeah i i have not reread this book but it, i think it's interesting thinking about what you mentioned about like language um being like a necessary thing for you for reading and i mean i think one thing that i noticed in this book like when i was thinking about it post um finishing it i realized that it's mostly composed of like dialogue and then like sex scenes and then Eve's interiority. And so I'm wondering, I know like we've talked like in the group chat about dialogue in books and how like we tend to generally like books that have less dialogue in them. And so I'm wondering, is your take on the language now, like do you think part of it has to do with the dialogue that's presented here or no? Okay, that's interesting because no, I actually think it has to do with the interior scenes in this. Um, 
because Eve, one of our main our main character, who should we summarize this book for people? Yeah. So I just realized I assumed everyone watching this has read it. So it's a, it's a very quick summary of what this book is about. Is essentially a love triangle um, between Eve, Nathan, and Olivia. But what makes this interesting is that Eve is in a queer relationship with a woman. She posts some news of herself online because she wants some spice in her life. Ends up meeting Olivia, who then introduces her to Nathan, and she gets involved while cheating on her girlfriend in this throuple situation. And the book is all about the morality of sex and desire and thinking about queerness underpinning all of these things. So that's very high level what it's about. So that, okay, there you go. <laughs> yes. So Eve, our main character, um, who we spend using questioning her, herself, like she thinks in questions, which I think ties back to maybe some larger themes of the book. So I'm less mad at it now that I make that connection. But she's like, I couldn't help but wonder if this is why Nathan did this. And I couldn't think, like, why is it that Eve did that question mark? Like, and it felt so trite to me and like contrived because that's not how people think. Like, I don't think people are sitting around and being like, I wonder how I felt about that thing that just happened to me. Like you think in sentences and periods and full stops so that was what was especially grating in the interior scenes for me with the writing specifically and I think that's just like a formal thing um but I did not like that upon my second my second uh reread yeah I mean I think what I why I liked it so much is I liked those sections and I liked how it kind of felt deeply philosophical and I it kind of I think about it in terms of like how I like to read or certain novels that I like in which it feels like the narrator is more like they're engaging in the practice of writing a novel and trying to like think through those things rather than being like actively representing the mind of someone if that makes sense mm. like less like stream of consciousness and more kind of like philosophical in that way I don't know if it's the right word but I mean yeah do you have any thoughts on that I can totally see that especially knowing who you are as a reader but I feel like there's Pure Color by Sheila Hetty that does that. And then there's this book. And I don't know if it's like the subject matter is maybe more lowbrow than Pure Color was, which was about like what it means to be alive and be a human. And this is like really rooted in sex and gender and sexuality and power dynamics, which are a part of what it means to be human. But um, some something about that like eternal questioning didn't, give me new insights or answers or perspectives or ways of looking at the same thing she was turning over. I'm holding a lighter in my hand. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> it just felt repetitious and like she was really nailing it home. And I was like, I get it. We don't know how these people relate to us and how it affects our identity as a queer woman. So I was, yeah. I was a little, a little fussy with that. No, that makes sense too. And something that's, like I talked about this in my interview with Lillian actually is about how like I love novels that focus on like the ways that humans structure their lives so like mm -hmm. I gave an example in there like motherhood by Sheila Hetty the entire book is a question of like how does motherhood or the choice not to how is that like serving as a structure for her life and then like fake accounts for example thinking about like internet and social media facades and how that all kind of like plays a structure for us and this one I think it's interesting thinking about like a structure of like sex and a power dynamic but quite like micro I would say compared to like those other two kind of broader themes of motherhood or like the internet or something like that um I'm wondering if that has something to do with it like the very micro way in which Eve is like using a very specific thing which is sex that's kind of like sex is I guess an event of sorts of like it's very like limited in its duration and like what it is I guess so I think I don't know if that has something to do with it I just kind of had that idea now but um I liked that it wasn't purely like just rooted in the sex of it all, I guess. And I, I don't know. Mm. I think it's interesting in that way and how it also ties back to queerness. So um, I guess that kind of goes into my next question is like, this book is very much rooted in like the morality of what's going on here. And to start, we know that she's in a relationship currently. And I think that's an interesting, like she could have started this book with just like a, a single woman who's kind of lonely that finds Olivia by posting online. And so what do you think about her using like this cheating setup as like the framework of the novel? Yeah, I think it's really interesting because 
a framework or like a headspace that Eve was really protective of throughout the entirety of the book was like this inner world and protecting it and um, really establishing in every relationship she had, what was her girlfriend's name? Uh, Romy. 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 Yeah. Really? <laughs> no me. <laughs> okay. Uh, really establishing that she didn't feel any measurable amount of guilt with Romy, which I found refreshing. I don't think she was too hung up on it. Um, she definitely fixated on Romy's noble 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 sense of self within her profession but I don't think that you felt any real guilt um with keeping secrets with uh having divergent interests that don't always serve her partner with just being in a a, a headspace that really required some like self-reliance and independence even if that had weird or gross or sticky consequences um, I think that's really what the, the relationship framework was setting Eve up for was this like ability to keep something to herself. So, so she has that time and space to be able to reflect and sit with it, which I found interesting. And I also think, uh, again, it opened up some, some interesting questions around, uh, monogamy and, monogamy as it relates to a lot of queer couples and kind of like the landscape of queerness we're living in now and how a lot of people structure their relationships um and how that's a choice you know what I mean how being monogamous or not is a choice and it doesn't really have a moral affect either way you split it Mm -hmm. yeah I mean that's interesting too like thinking how the lack of guilt she feels about the cheating that's going on here but like compared to like her guilt about her feelings for Nathan like having this compulsion to be in a heterosexual relationship and what that means for like her queer identity I think is really interesting and I think it's an interesting contrast with like what would typically be seen as like what she should be feeling guilty for versus what she actually does and how she starts to like frame her own identity through Nathan and like what that means for her um because I think she kind of, she feels attracted to it, right? But then she also like doesn't want that. She's like, wait, like what, what is this really going on? And I think that kind of lends itself to the interior sections, but um, Ricky makes a good point. Sexualities are confusing as fuck sometimes. Figuring out what we want and how we feel can be a super complex process. I like seeing that play out with Eve, yeah. Um, she's a very reflective and, um, I don't know. She seems very like, what's the right word? I keep thinking paranoid. That's not the right word. (laughs) Um, She's just very like self-critical, I guess, or analytical, which I think is something I tend to like. Um, And she's also someone, she's also someone who's like desperate for structure and purpose and like absolutism, which I found really weird at times and unrelatable. Like the way she frames Nathan, Eve and Romy is just in black and white absolutes and puts kind of constraints on them. Like Romy is the healthcare hero who is strong and takes care of people and uh, is kind of like the puppy dog girlfriend who is just a caretaker, right? Nathan is Nathan. Eve is a wounded little bird who is confused and doesn't know what power she holds in their trio and what that, that dynamic means for her. And she is so committed to believing that about people and like shook when it, when it changes and shifts, which I think is just really interesting. Like her search for like the totality and like naming of, of certain identities or morals or ideals in people, especially coming from like a queer woman who is living in the squishy parts of sexual and gender identity politics I found I found kind of like that's that's like the meat of the book. That book that's the the conflict that she's really faced with with her relationships with these characters. So so it's important. I just found it um, a little foreign to think in that absolutism and that um, rigidity rigidity around people's roles. I guess in her life, she was really just like casting. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, no, totally. And I, I know I sent this to you earlier, but I was thinking about this question and I found this interview of hers online. It was a written interview and she talks about how she wrote about bisexuality and queerness in this book and the certain like um, uncomfortableness that she had in even like writing the novel herself. And she talks about how, this is a direct quote, there are a lot of, ta- there are lots of taboo and discomfort around bisexuality because it's so based on traditional binary concepts of gender. Eve's attraction and her interest in this experience is based in a very conventional framework. That's what bothers her about it and what drives the thematic meat of the novel. And so I think it's interesting. I think what she's sort of saying here is like, Eve seems to be drawn to the fact that like Nathan is a cis man, like in, in a sense, like she's like really interested in like, in that and how she's trying to use his like, she talked about it many times in the book, Eve, meaning um, his sense of like freedom that he has and like whether he mm. thinks about their sexual dynamic the same way that she does, or if it's just kind of like a given or like how he, there's one scene in which he like hands a, um, a menu back to a waiter and how he doesn't have any like hesitancy or seems just so assured and Eve's like, do I, like, what is the difference there and how can I like frame my life in a way that Nathan does and how that kind of blends with their sex too. It's, I, I don't know, I like that she kind of pushes against a more like contemporary framework in that front um which i've only really seen like in a queer book like this i'm mm-hmm. um, curious to know if anyone like happens to have i don't know any like have you seen it similarly discussed in other work um but yeah i feel like she's like oh my attraction to this cis het dude especially as someone who's been partnered primarily with women means i have internalized homophobia because of my desire for him but it's like no dude you're just like you're queer you're bisexual like you're attracted to Nathan and all of the inherited politics too of being in a queer relationship and being in a queer space especially if you engage in the political aspects of that identity that's just the burden of this book and it's so fun and interesting to see her work through it and I think is really the the differentiator between some of these contemporary love triangle books that we've seen. Because, I mean, what is this in conversations with? It's conversations with friends. <laughs> and, <Alex> says. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And then, um, what's the one in Hong Kong? Exciting um, times. Exciting times, yes. Mm-hmm. Totally. And so one thing about this setup that I want to ask you about, I don't know if I'm being too, like, overthinking about this, but I think it's really interesting in terms of, like, how this novel lends itself to some like voyeurism into a relationship that most of us like wouldn't normally have access to in terms of like, so I guess first part of this, like Nathan and Olivia don't really seem to be preoccupied with like what's going on whatsoever. It's like completely Eve's like own, like what is going on? And like, Olivia's like, I'm doing this because Nathan wants me to, and I want to like please him through this. And so like that brings me pleasure if Nathan's happy. Right. And so, but then as Eve is a narrator of this book, she, brings the questions of like morality of the dynamic dynamic to the reader and i'm wondering like what do you think about a reader like reading this dynamic and bringing their own like moralities and judgment to it versus like in real life this is just for, like nathan and olivia it's just sex and like something that brings them joy or pleasure like it doesn't seem to be like a more existential thing as it is for eve but in a novel, I think that's it makes more it... so. I feel like that's more so a byproduct, just because Eve is our narrator, and we don't have yeah. like interior access to Nathan and Eve. It's always filtered through Eve's perspective. You know what I mean? Like, I think yeah. Eve thinks it's just sex for Nathan and Olivia, but I think that is proven not true throughout the entirety of the book. Um, and I think Eve and Nathan are posturing every time they say that too. They're like, this is just our, you know, domination kink. I'm like, is it? <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. that's affecting them and rooted in something too. Um, so I think they're low-key gaslighting Eve a little bit too. Every time they're like, you're in your head, like get out of that. So. Yeah. No, totally. I mean, I think it's, so one character that, I left this fascinated by is Olivia and this dynamic. And Mm. one thing that I asked Lillian about was like, like what, like, what did you, how did Olivia come to you? Like, what is, what is the, what's going on with Olivia is essentially what I wanted to know. And she said that like Olivia represents this type of womanhood that's quite mysterious to her. And she said she could have never, 
she couldn't write this novel from Olivia's perspective, just because there's certain aspects of her identity that are mysterious to her. And so I'm wondering, like, what you made of Olivia in, as like a foil to Eve, in particular. I feel like I have no impression of Olivia. Like, do you? Like, I feel like it's so meditated through Eve's desire to label name and like put boundaries on people and and their role in their lives. So it's like, I, I can't even think of who Olivia is without the Eve context on it. And the Eve context is so binary and like you're demure, you're in service of Nathan, like you're trapped in this weird like hetero patriarchy sex fantasy about domination and being of service to a man so it's like I guess I I can't imagine who that person is I can't imagine being her but like that person definitely exists but I also don't feel like that is reflective of all of who Olivia is yeah no I totally agree I, it was interesting thinking about like how she even like in the text addresses like how she'll she, Olivia feels completely like inaccessible and it was I think it was fascinating reading Olivia though because I'm because like the entire time I'm like what is going on like the mis the mystery of her is what makes her enticing to me as a reader I think mm. um I kind of like that I like that this book kind of stayed within Eve's perspective but I'm like wondering what this novel would have been like if we would have been in the heads of like other characters I think it would have been a much worse novel but that's just my initial thought um, I agree too, because I would like decenter all of the queer woman desires of cis het men ness at all, which is the most juicy parts to to stick with. Don't you think like I okay, upon reread too, I was like, Olivia's description is so corny. Like she's wearing tights and like reading her paperback novel and like I was like, it was so judgment I was like does this person exist anymore like what year is Olivia living in it was giving like 2016 Taylor Swift meets folklore like I who is Olivia <laughs> oh my gosh drag wow um <laughs> sorry know, that's interesting but like okay so this is a question that I have about that is this I I, I tend to like when I sometimes don't require realism in Mm. in novels like this I think it's kind of fun when a writer kind of plays with like those kind of lines but I, I see what you're saying too of like the critique of like what of like why Olivia's presented that way um but there's something it just that... doesn't give me any access again to who she who who she is I was like okay to Eve she's wearing yeah Kieran she's wearing like floral length skirts and bringing her paper back I just couldn't visualize her I'm like who is this mousy weirdo um <laughs> like who do you think would play her in a movie you guys yeah that's a great question everyone think about it <laughs> <laughs> hello everyone sorry i feel like i'm being bad about putting comments up i just don't want to interrupt the flow um international booker hello katie um yeah i mean what do we want to talk about next sorry i just lost my train of thought um we're over olivia over olivia <laughs> Oh, okay. So how about we talk about Nathan and what okay. he represents? I mean, I think, so one thing that's really interesting is, sorry to keep referencing my interview, but I think it's interesting bringing her thoughts to this because it's like- Plug know, it, baby. Interesting. Yeah. So it was, she said that by the end of the book, and I agree, like I also got this interpretation when I read it, this book does not feel like an indictment of Nathan whatsoever. Mm -mm. And I think a lot of reviews that I've seen merely say like, okay, Nathan's trash, dynamics, weird, like this book, not good. But I think there's more going on to what Nathan's doing in this book. And I wanted to talk about like what you think about him as a character, because she said like she loves him by the end of the book, which I think is a really interesting take. And I haven't seen many that agree with that response, I guess. So like, what do you make of him? What he's doing? I'm like, yeah, I'm chill. I'm chill with the sexual power dynamics that he's deploying consensually on sexual partners that he's with. And I think that's like what a lot of people want to tar and feather him for is um, all of like the submission stuff, which is just like, get over it. Like you're boring. Um, like that's not a real critique. If yeah, you're no. a consenting adult having sex with someone. Um, I think 
like like there's literally a Nathan quote that says challenging you is not the same as violating you, which I feel like was the toe that the author was walking on the whole time, right? Um, what gets interesting with Nathan for me is when he he's kind of opaque to me too. Like can't see him. Is he Chuck Bass? Like he's paying for dinner. He's giving the girls what they want. He seems like a nice guy. He's not mean to them. Um, seems okay. <laughs> like I'm, I'm fine with Nathan as a person. When he gets interesting to me is when Eve find, finds out he's married, um, which I think is supposed to be like a big twist in the book because it's like pretty near the end. Um, they don't really talk about their personal lives with one another. He had never mentioned it previously, um, but there are several mentions to a ring on his hand throughout the book. So I picked up on it before. I was like, oh, is, is he going to be married? Is that the twist? Okay. And it turns out he is. Um, his wife knows, supposedly. We never get to find out or meet her. Um, so I think that adds a layer of something to him and also complicates like the Eve-Nathan relationship even more. And then I guess the other only notable fact about him is he gets, you're the lawyer. Is it subpoenaed to court? Yeah, yeah. He gets, okay, great. He gets, <laughs> yeah. He gets subpoenaed to court because there's like a sexual misconduct case at his work where a woman he was interviewing makes a case against him and um, he asks Eve to testify, which is like a whole other thing that I think will open us up to a new set of questions. But basically, Nathan, I'm like, I'm chill with him. I don't know if I love him by the end of the book. Um, but I was never, he was never the villain. Yeah. No, it's interesting. And I think she intentionally like, brings a lawsuit into the case to further, like, make the reader at least, again, like, in retrospect, be like, wait, what is this guy doing, sort of? Like, I think she's trying to play with the reader's assumptions of Nathan. But I do think it's interesting thinking about, like, Eve, by the end of the book, the last sentence talks about how, like, what Nathan gave to her is, like, the greatest the greatest act of service she's ever received. And, like, what do you think about, like, in contrast to everything you just said about his character, like, in terms of Eve's own self-discovery and, like, where we leave her at the end of this novel, like, is it a, what he did for her, is that a good thing? Like, if she says it is, you know what I mean? Again, it's a question of, like, what we think upon reading this as her as, like, a character is, like, weird. Because it's, like, she's, like, she thinks she's cool, like, with what happened, but then there's still, like, this kind of gray area of, like, wait, what, what does Nathan represent? I don't know. Like, what is the act of service? Is that her, like, being able to morally unpick, like, like, in internalized homophobia to, like, bisexuality and being able to sleep with cishet people and, like, divorce that from her, her politics a little bit? I guess that's the act of service. Well, so, like, this comment says, it's interesting how Eve was trying to be more and more like him as the book went on, and that's kind mm -hmm. of, like, she gave, he gave her a sort of, like, framework. Freedom. To under, yeah, freedom. Autonomy. Like, understanding what she can ask or ask for of people around her and, like, receive from them. Like, whether, like, being seen by Nathan is enough for her own, like, self-discovery, but then, again, it morphs into this thing where she's trying to, like, be him and trying to, like, emulate him, like, in her approach to the dynamic um which is really interesting in terms of like how the, the dynamic even started versus like where she tries to like get it to go as an novel progresses is, is interesting but um interesting i felt like nathan was daring you to hate him but using consent as permission to do whatever he wants well that's the thing with like the dynamic with olivia in the first place of like olivia doesn't want to like have sex with eve i think it's very clear that she's like not she's like consenting to it because nathan nathan but like it's also that it's a weird line because like she doesn't want to be doing that though but like mm -hmm. does she because she's like nathan it's weird i don't know and i also I think to... eve is kind of sketch and like coercive to have sex with olivia and like meet with her alone you know mm -hmm. um which i like from the author and another little head spinning moment of reversing that kind of usual dynamic yeah. I don't know about, I don't know, so much of like queerness as a politic is about inter interdependence and like not this, not this idea of 
self-serving freedom for freedom's sake, you know what I mean? Um, which I think Nathan is kind of a champion of. Like, do whatever you want if it makes you feel good. You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of the essence of of the way he moves through the world, which is pretty easy when you're a straight white man. Um, and I think that is what Eve is struggling with. And I don't know if it's a good thing by at the end of the book that she has a little bit more of that. Uh, maybe it is in, in balance to kind of like her foundational outlook on life, but um, that is kind of a scarier worldview to me than, than being ultra considerate and thinking about how, how your personal connections and impact connect the community you're a part of and the people you're connected to. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it kind of brings me back to our first discussion on here, the Rooney book about like this question of, of like autonomy and personal like happiness at the sake mm -hmm. of like others and like that weird, I love novels that question that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's interesting how this did it through like a more, again, micro like setup of this relationship. I think the Rooney book is a little bit more like I don't know, with the essays and everything, it's a little different things going on, but similar, like, similar things thematically, I think. Um, this comment's really interesting. <laughs> I found the lawsuit situation so dull and very American. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, it kind of felt like it was put in to um, do something with the plot, because, like, I don't know where she would have, like, like, where do you end this book if not with, like, adding something like that? I don't know. Like, what, what do you think of the lawsuit? Has it plays near the end of the novel yeah I mean it was just like a device again of of toying with like who Eve was responsible to is it her feminism is it her her queerness is it Nathan is it Olivia is it to this unknown woman who's testifying against him who she has absolutely no idea you know the context of her claim and I think that's even mm -hmm. more interesting in this me too era believe women you know the whole thing um especially because i think eve you know I, i'm kind of focusing back on eve coercing olivia a little bit more low-key like i think i think even uh eve herself at one point she was like am i supposed to think that i could like help olivia more than nathan just because i'm a woman and i like i like that she's even questioning harm that she's able to do to the same sex in a course of uh, like emotional manner as well. Um, so I think that's what the lawsuit meant to me it was just like another framework for her to think about justice and and who who she was responsible to and why. Um, mm. And a lot of the the boundaries that she she backed herself into uh, by choice. Yeah, that's really interesting that you mentioned that because like I hadn't really thought about. I thought less of like her relationship with Olivia at the end of it. And I think it is interesting to think about like her responsibility that she feels towards Olivia and also like kind of going back to what we're saying before about how, how her as a woman, like what she's doing in this dynamic and how like that plays out with her. Cause I think Lillian said that she started writing this book as like a, an examination of Olivia and Eve's relationship first. But then as she kept going, she ended up realizing it's a book about Eve and Nathan namely. Um, and the Olivia and Eve relationship kind of became more or less like the heart or focus of the novel. But I do think it's, it's fun to read that dynamic, I think. And it's, cause it's really like having, I don't know, reading like a threesome with two people that like, don't like, they don't want that side of the triangle. You know what I mean? It's just interesting to think about how she went about writing that. Um, yeah and like the not that part being inherent to the desire and like satisfaction to everyone who's in it which is weird too like the mm -hmm. the restraint and power power around restraint i think is an interesting thing um that sex is specifically doing in this book mm -hmm. so eve felt hell sus and how she viewed one olivia even though olivia made it clear she wasn't into eve interesting yeah, yeah I think to, I, I think I picked up on that more in my reread. Mm -hmm. Well, is it? I had a thought, but I don't. I don't know. Okay, never mind. <laughs> um, Ricky, CJ's casting question. I kept picturing. I don't oh know yeah, it is. from um, the Quentin Tarantino movie. 
I can see oh. that. I can see that as Liv. I think that's the Hollywoodification of Liv. I'll give you that, Ricky. <laughs> Who is Nathan? Nathan's is Nathan blonde. I feel like Nathan's a blonde man. I don't know if it's because I was listening to his album recently, but he kind of gives me Harry Styles, maybe like. Oh, he wishes. <laughs> I, so I think I saw a comment talking about Nathan seems hot. I agree. I agree. I have to. I have to say it. He seemed hot, <laughs> but like also corny to me for some reason. But like maybe that's why he was hot. It was like the the bimbofication of like him as like a hot dude. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's funny when Eve's earnest cyclical thinking is questioned when talking to her roommate and her roommate challenges her basically saying why people are crazy. I forgot about um, the roommate. Yeah. Yeah, that Fatima and um, her dad are like the only other side characters. And I loved, it, it's weird too that, again, going back to like Eve's personal world and her desire for secrecy, but she she does like dump onto her roommate all of the ins and outs just to have some kind of a mirror. And I liked that that mirror was was one that um, was like, what is wrong with you? Like, this seems like a mess. Uh, and I, I liked that. I think uh, she did want to be in a mess on purpose and she got called out for it. Yeah, definitely. I think it kind of like lends itself to, I think what many readers kind of think as they're reading this book too. I mean, I think Lillian Fishman's very aware of like, oh yeah, what the perception is going to be of like what's going on here. Um, so I think it was kind of funny having her in the book to like, give some um, comedy to the situation. I think that was, mm -hmm. that was nice to read. And the dad, as you mentioned. Um, yeah, and like Eve's subplot of being rich and like, she's like, I come from wealth, but I don't want to, and which is another like uh, interesting white guilt, like queer politic thing, especially someone living in Portland, Oregon. Like I, I, see that very deeply in some people I know in real life and I think her inability to like own own or like even redistribute any kind of privilege that she's going to inherit one day was another ick for Eve but I know Lillian Fishman is aware of it you know what I mean yeah yeah totally Oh, another interesting take. I listened to the audiobook and my boyfriend commented, is this man really written by a woman because he seems so corny? I mean... He's a himbo. What? He's like, he's he's written by a woman, but he's like supposed to be a man. Yeah. I, there's something that's so enticing to me about Nathan. And y'all can drag me in the comments if you want to. I, I don't know like what... I know. Canceled. Um, I just think he's interesting in like this, the certain aspects of him that we don't like get to see again through just being in Eve's like we're only seeing him through what Eve is like telling us she perceives him as like she's I think some of what she's what she narrates in the book about Nathan is some, more of her own like projection of like what she wants to like see in him and like what she's trying to get from the dynamic and then I wonder like from an objective view what we would see about him but it's still morally questionable given like the things that we learned about him throughout I don't know I don't know that's just a take I had that came to mind yeah, yeah I think like I kept envisioning like early gossip girl Chuck Bass in my head and like that made it corny to me um no I don't think so Alex I don't even think he's cool enough to listen to Phoebe Bridgers like I feel like he wears a bad suit and is like a midtown finance guy like I don't even think he has swag that might be me hating mm. men, but that was my impression of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting thinking about how like Eve elevates certain aspects of his personality again, like this this idea of like autonomy and freedom, and like whether those mm. things should even be like lauded by her. I mean, I think it's a natural like, human response to want to feel like you have power. Again, this is a book a lot about power and um, how she desires that. And I don't know. I mean, is there? Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or 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 the guy who just played Elvis in the new Elvis biopic. Mm -hmm. That corny guy. It. Yeah. This is what I'm saying. Would you still date him though? <laughs> I I think I would for the experience of it all, which is why I'm toxic like Eve. Like I want the story out of it. 
Um, and I want to yeah. see what it feels like when I try it on, which is like human and natural and what she has so much guilt against because her politics tell her otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, which is funny to like boilerplate down what this book is about. It's like he's hot and she's mad about it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this book also is about, like, you know, 20 something like, engaging in a lot of sex. I think it's interesting, like, what the temporal aspects of this, or, like, the age things are doing, like, in this book, too, that don't really go explored, I don't think. Um, <laughs> I mean... We don't have to date. They're not dating. They're just yeah. seeing each other. <laughs> yeah, I mean... They wanted some nice. They wanted some nice dates, though. I think, from what I recall. Yeah, they had some nice, nice cocktails. There's some whiskey involved. It was a whole thing. Mm-hmm. You know, like he would mansplain whiskey to you and be like, "This is the whiskey that you drink with the ice cube," and you're like, "Okay, Nathan." Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's just my vibe on him. Yeah. So, I guess bringing it full so- full circle, do you consider this to be a DWM? No. Depressed. Depressed woman moving not wait hold on depressed woman moving through the world novel I sometimes yes. get questions about that still so I sort of define it so you don't think so I don't think so because I don't think Eve is depressed interesting at all Eve's having a good ass time she's working her barista job she's in these mess- messy entanglements like she is philosophically conflicted but I don't think she's experiencing any like ennui. That's interesting, because I don't know why I was reading that on to Eve as a character. Mm. Um, do you guys Nathan Pegg? I think you do. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Just Eve kidding. is bored. Yeah. I, but yeah, maybe I'm conflating, like, uncertainty and, like, searching with, like, assuming that she's sad about it. And maybe she's not. Maybe she's just, like, trying to navigate the weirdness of, like, being... I had an uncert with like her identity, like you're mentioning, like her, I don't know, trying to piecemeal or piece together those two things. I don't know. And maybe it's because like we didn't get access to any other part of Eve outside of like when she's thinking about her entanglement with all of these people and what it means to her that I don't have any depressed read. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think she's depressed about her place in this relationship with these people she might be in her life and we have no access to it. And maybe you're just intuiting that she is, but I don't think she's depressed. Yeah. And again, I think it's an interesting, like intentional, I think framing of the novel as being like purely for the most part about like just the dynamics of this relationship, which is really, I, I like, it was kind of refreshing for me to read compared to like some other things that I've read recently, I guess. I thought it was interesting that she like uses that as a, she also has an MFA from NYU, which is, something to note i've been trying to like track mfa novels that i'm reading and like what that means if anything <laughs> um, yeah. i see like on book twitter like people are like oh the, the general like mfa discourse of it all you know but yeah yeah i think i think this book is worth your time if you read a lot of books like this and i don't think it's a good or perf- a great or perfect book i think it's good um but I think this would be a really weird reading experience if you like don't read any millennial fiction and I think you would think it's really micro and like talks because you I don't know if you would have access to like that's what makes it special is the micro of it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah this this whole conversation is really because I walked away from this I love loved 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 this book so much of course I've been talking about it nonstop, but I think I would love to reread this now after having this discussion and see like what I think about it because I think it's, it's just, like, I think, I don't know. I'm trying to get a read on, like, everyone in the comments, let me know if you, did you like this? Like, what was your rating? Or, like, do you like it? I'm curious to know. Cause I think we're, mm-hmm. I'm just curious. Um, I feel like you, you are the person I know who likes it the most out of everyone I know who's read it. If that gives you a barometer. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's a weird feeling. Cause I'm like, wait, <laughs> like what? I don't know. I, 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 I feel just like love... you're just, you love queer shit too and I don't think you read a lot of it and when you do read some you're like okay that's tea I always I talk about like I never read queer like I don't often read queer stuff when I do I'm like this bangs and I'm like well duh no shit um yeah no it's interesting 
and I, I also tend to like any book that's like even remotely like philosophical about mm-hmm. things and I think it was the first time I've ever read a book that's like philosophical about sex Ooh. um and also adding like a queer element to it I was like this is my shit I couldn't stop reading it when I picked it up but um got three stars dude Alex is on it wait I knew Eve was done forever since so she said, what a pleasure to be on this one. Even if that obviously, oh my God. Like, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I love you, Lillian Fishman, but like, it was a little MFA in the writing. But I think that's because Eve's corny too. Like, maybe it's an intentional corny choice. You know, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with like, even Eve's interiority and how, how she's thinking because she views people in such a corny lens. There's a corniness factor to this that I can't wrap my head around, you guys. Okay. This goes into the thing that I always ask myself. And I'm still okay. like, I love asking other readers about this. The unlikability, like, analyzing the characters for their likability or not. Like, whether Eve is corny or not. It doesn't bother me as a reader. Like, I loved reading the corniness of, like, Eve and Nathan. Like, I love that shit. But, like, I don't, mm. I don't. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't, like, I love, like, Moshdag, who all of her characters are, feel very, like, often or, I don't know, engaging in behavior that's considered weird or it's whatever. It's contemporary corniness that feel, it's, okay, so, like, this is probably, miso- like, internalized misogyny for me, okay? That's T2. That's honestly where we're going with this. But I was, like, maybe it's, like, the contem- the contemporary descriptions of these women and, like, a judgment I'm passing on them. Like the the floor length skirt, like I Moshveg, you can't place these people in a certain time period. I think without maybe Eileen, because it's um retro, you know what I mean? It's like set in the 60s. Mm-hmm. But like the descriptions are descriptions of things you can you can place today. And I think that is a judgment I'm casting on these other women characters. So mm-hmm. maybe I do need to calm down. Um <laughs> I don't, it, it's not about likability though to me. It was just like their essence. They're, they're <laughs> corny. Yeah. <laughs> that was so funny to me. Um, yeah. Yes. Slim the idiot. Yeah. Well, okay, that's interesting. That's interesting. I'm trying to think about. I'm trying Ricky to just think dragged me. Speak. Ricky so, dragged <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah, no, no one's talking me out of the experience. I fucking love this book. I will stand by that. I think yeah. it's so it's so fun. I think I don't know. It's just I love I love hearing counter um opinions just to like help me question or think of like, wait, why do I I'm always wondering why do I think what I think? And I think this book does that. Hey. Um <laughs> Time. Yeah, I, mean, I, re- I recommend it. Is there anything else we should talk about? We're coming up close to the hour. I'm trying to think. Does anyone have comments, questions? Comments, concerns. I hope this doesn't get adapted. Oh my God. I'm sick of it. I hope, no. Okay. I have a hot take for the peeps. Um, no more adaptions. <laughs> yeah. It's well of Rooney novels. Stop it now. I, I watched two episodes of Normal People. And I, I knew going into it, I was like, I'm very, I don't know, didn't love it. Haven't even watched combos with friends because I heard it's boring as hell. And I'm like, duh, it's Rooney novels aren't boring, but like watching that on TV just does not sound appealing to me whatsoever. Like I need the interiority. I need the novel I need this as the form. I don't need it to be visual. But that's my hot take. Normal people, the adaptation, I would say slapped. Like it was giving. And then the combo with friends, not giving really terrible and sally rooney didn't adapt to that one which i think is why yeah i mean uh, hated yes and he loved so he agrees with you alex agrees mm-hmm. um, oh yeah olivia's art oh my god this was the cor- this was actually my biggest problem with the book this was the corniest this is what i hated the most upon my reread the fact that her secret art this whole time, her secret art practice that we didn't ever see what it looked like until the very end at her show was fucking figurative paintings of the three of them in bed, like having sex together. So corny. Why is that corny? 
so literal. That's like the most yeah. literal interpretation of like making art out of your experience that I could ever imagine. Here's my lighter again. I'm setting it on fire. Um, okay. My initial counterpoint on that though is- Okay, give it to me. It, it's going back to, how do I put this? Um, it's going back to a question I asked before about like why, like, uh the voyeurism of like looking at this dynamic right and i think it's interesting mm. that olivia ends up like putting it for display and again it's mm. like a weird look to me because i'm like we're getting this we're in the sex with these people you know what i mean and i think it's interesting i don't know that's just initial thought that i had of like putting that there but um i like that I to... most people agree with you cj i like your point though like... that was a good point you grounded it a little bit more for me <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know, like, because I feel like, like, what would the art have been, like, a bite out of an apple? Like, that would have been corny <laughs> to me, you know what I mean? Like, or like something like that, like, I don't know. Yeah, I guess, like, describing visual art in books can go so terribly anyway, like, that shit has to be dialed and is really hard to pull off. Um, so I don't know if she was like really set up for success, especially where she's at in her writing career of like pleasing me as a reader for that personally. And I do, I do like what you said about the obviousness of it and, and putting it on display. I think voyeurism and like exhibitionism, especially with something that's so secretive and interpersonal for them is like a good balance to what can just see as like you know, making something realized and, and, and to like duplicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I would just, I wanted to pull something from Sheila Hetty's blurb because she's, a, so you read it. And then um, I saw like Sheila Hetty blurb like in the lead up to this release. And she says, um, I was completely absorbed by this radical, daring, embracing novel about a so cold and yet so intimate world where safety and pleasure can be found only in the most unlikely and unpredictable of places. It is a book of exciting, provocative complexity, and for me, made the human creature feel like something new. My read on everyone in this chat right now is, you don't agree with Miss Hetty. <laughs> um, but I think it's interesting how she's how it, like kind of, cause that's what it felt like to me too, like thinking of the, this idea of desire in this framework of this novel is so compelling to me. And I'm like, so I, I'm just fascinated by hearing other people's opinions. I'm like, what is the, the difference going on like intakes here i'm trying to like mm. figure out what it is but i think it might be this perception of the corniness like I, I don't know i don't know don't know what it is i think i might be able... smart dialogue yeah how did the right. dialogue feel to us yeah. i loved it was giving like rooney and being good i think mm. um but again, it uses like the no quotation thing, which I think is intentional. Um, I don't know. Like, I, I think it was necessary. Like, again, like with the interiority of this book and like only being in Eve's head, like we needed that to understand like what, like what is at least what Olivia and Nathan, like what are they presenting to her? And yeah, I think it felt realistic to me. I don't think it felt like too contrived or poised. Mm -hmm. Well, I was okay do you with think, it. Do you? So, I know one critique that you had of like Rooney's latest was how you felt the dialogue felt, or the miscommunication, or like people not saying like what, like I think you said something like "speak, please," like <laughs> to them, to the characters in it. Like I'm wondering what. Did you feel that in this book or not? I don't think so. I think they like overly communicated their boundaries, desires, and experience like while it was happening and literally post coital. <laughs> yeah. Um, like they immediately got into the experience they just had and like psychoanalyzing it to the nth degree. Um and what it meant to them. So I don't think I felt that. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I was like, let me dial a friend, Miss Hetty. Yes. <laughs> to defend me. Um <laughs> Alex liked the dialogue. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It was really it was cool. Like even at the end, like with the art display and like Olivia and Eve talking to each other very frankly about like what their desires were. Like I remember there's one part where Eve says, like, why do you think like this is an interesting thing too of like you're right how honest and open their communication is because 
Eve's like, why do you like thank Nathan so much? And she's like, well, aren't you grateful for like what he's bringing, doing to us? I think that's like a, I don't know. It's interesting like how open and like questioning they are with each other. But I still feel like there's a little bit of like an, um, something to go left unsaid between the three of them that I think are, is interesting. Or, like what Lillian chooses to like put in the dialogue versus not. I think it's well done. Um, totally. And I like that Nathan spends so much time with Olivia while Eve is still in the apartment too. And like, we, she's like spinning out in her head about what's happening while, while they're like having their whole own experience that we never get to see. Right. And there's even like periods where they don't see each other for quite a bit of time. Mm -hmm. um, and it, going back to like the, the question of whether he's married or not, like that came to me as a surprise. I don't know if I'm, I don't know. Like I just, I didn't really see it coming just because of how like, what, what Lillian keeps from the reader, I think, is intentional. Of like, you kind of assume that like Nathan and Olivia are like this sort of like solid unit, but it kind of you learn more by the end of it, I guess. But um, would I recommend this to someone who doesn't like Rooney? Yes, I would. I think. Would I? I don't actually. I don't know. I don't know. What don't you like about Rooney? Right. If it's a miscommunication, which I feel like is what she usually gets dragged for, is that her characters can't talk to each other, express their feelings, then yes, read this, because I don't think that's a, a barrier. Um, but if you don't like young, sad people having sex with each other, trying to figure out what it means, then mm -hmm. maybe don't. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of feels like a beautiful world to me in terms of, like, Alice questioning, like, her place as a novelist, like through her writing. And I think Eve's narration is inherently like self-reflective in a similar way. So I think maybe if you like that one, I would recommend it. I don't know. Yeah, I need to know like what you don't like, right? Poor Rooney, dude. Poor every novelist working alongside her. I know. Always mentioned. Always mentioned. <laughs> the blueprint. I'm guilty. I think I mentioned her first, but um, <laughs> well, I think that about does it on the discussion. Um, for okay. The hour. Um, so I wanted to quickly announce next month's pick is either or. Ella Fatiman. Um, this is a sequel to The Idiot, but I've read that it's a standalone. Like you don't have to read The Idiot, but I would. I know most. I was like, I feel like I'm very late to the party. I just read it like a couple months ago, um, but I'm discussing with Alex from Patreon. <laughs> Um, at the end of June, I think it's June 28th, same time as now. Um, very excited to chat this one. I haven't read it yet, so who knows where I'll land on it. But yeah, join us then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. For joining. It was fun. Love you. It was spicy conversation. <laughs> spicy, spicy. Thanks, CJ. Bye, Thanks, little cat from Sunnies. I promise I won't talk about this book much more, how that I did this. <laughs> We're over it. <laughs> over it. I'm sorry, everyone. All right. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>